Then, at 2.50 p.m., more than half the runners were through. The first bomb explodes. Breaking news from Canada. Police say they've broken up an Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist attack that was aimed to disrupt a major North American transportation route. A sharp new warning of all-out war. For the first time, the mysterious and secretive nation has threatened a preemptive nuclear strike against the U.S. Staying in Europe, Spain is also feeling the economic pinch. One in four are now currently unemployed in that country, and the EU expects that number to climb even higher. China and neighboring countries are mobilizing resources to fight off a new strain of bird flu. Hospitals in a race against time to contain nightmare super bacteria before it spreads from the hospital out into ah. the world. Jesus, you scared me. But hey, I guess that's okay, right? I mean, if you watch the news these days, there seems to be a lot to be concerned about. Nuclear war, terrorism, mass shootings, city bombings, corporate fraud, bird flu, bank failures, unemployment, contamination, gangs, general crime, and depending on your temperament and conditioning, perhaps you've already armed yourself to the teeth and are watching this show from an underground bunker somewhere, waiting for the end of civilization itself. Well, whatever the concern, the idea of protection or security from such woes are ever pervasive today. Prisons, police, insurance, warranties, protection agencies, military and domestic armament, airport groping, government surveillance and the like, reveals a, a culture of fear, if you will, on many levels. Not to mention that the modern trends of such security risks are certainly fascinating. For example, before the 1980s, the thought of someone going into their workplace and, you know, wiping out a couple people was a relatively remote concept. Today, we repeatedly see these acts of seemingly random violence, not only in businesses, but in schools, churches, movie theaters, malls, sporting events, and other common institutions. And as unfortunate as this dark reality of our human capacity is, it's perhaps not as unfortunate as the archaic methods we as a civilization have concocted in our attempt to counter such problems. For instance, in the wake of growing U.S. gun violence, the National Rifle Association will tell you that the problem is a lack of armed security at every turn. And if we only would just, you know, arm everybody like the Wild West, problems of social violence would subside. While at the other extreme, folks will tell you that the problem is rather due to an ease of access. It's too simple to get weaponry. And the removal of this easy access is now the correct path. However, do either of these address the real issue? the source of the behavioral problem at hand? Where is the national discussion about, say, motivation and the sociological condition itself to which these acts erupt? I point this out because in a technological age where people can now print automatic weapons in secret with home 3D printers, paving the way for an eventual nanotech revolution that will enable the public to create powerful weapons at home, bypassing commercial regulation itself, Perhaps we need to rethink our sense of causality here. For unless you intend to outlaw scientific progress itself, regulation isn't going to amount to a damn thing in the long run. Likewise, come to think of it, maybe we also need to step back and reframe what a viable threat to our safety really is and how it measures up to other threats. You know, on April 15th, 2013, bombs exploded during the Boston Marathon in the United States, killing three people gaining global attention, almost like it was another 9-11. Yet in Iraq, on the exact same Monday, bombs exploded killing 20 times as many people, and yet no one in the mainstream media seemed to care much about that. You see, if you pay attention, you might notice that the true quantifiable magnitude of a threat or the actual toll of violence really doesn't mean much in the establishment perception. It's the idea, the context, the political spectacle that matters, and this might explain why America has spent almost $5 trillion on so-called terrorism when U.S. citizens today and statistically have always been more likely to die of a peanut allergy or in the bathtub than in a terrorist attack. So as the following episode will argue, the security fear industry, stretching from the ever-exploitative news media to the military-industrial complex to the criminal justice system, not only exploits sociological distortion birthed out of the very fabric of our deprivation, scarcity-driven social order, it now appears to be accelerating in a vicious cycle. 
And I don't know about you, but given all of this, I'm beginning to suspect that maybe, just maybe, the very foundation of our socioeconomic system is in play here. No longer existing as a functional mode for human progress on this planet, but rather as a conduit for a culture in decline. Prison, from the dark dungeons of the Middle Ages to our modern industrial mass incarceration correctional facilities, the prison system is a signature edifice of society today. The United States, the land of the free, now has the highest inmate population in the world, incarcerating over 2.3 million, in fact. The U.S. has locked up more people than any other country on the planet, boastfully housing 25% of the entire world's prison population with an 800% increase in incarceration in the past 30 years alone. Based partly on the need to remove active threats from society, coupled with an ever bleak undertone of retribution and revenge, the punitive negative reinforcement tradition common to our justice system is now being challenged by some very basic realizations in the human sciences. We often forget that when it comes to human conduct, true behavioral causality has historically been ignored with the focus rather on spooky, superstitious forces such as good and evil. Well, as convenient as such ambiguous metaphysical assumptions are, modern social science now places so-called criminal or anti-social acts in the context of public health, with real solutions resting in the arena of preventive medicine, not mere punishment. Of course, as with most rational perspectives in the world today, this view is rather agitated. For it shatters the glorified, free will, morally empirical, traditional assumptions our entire criminal justice system is built upon. However, let's put that aside for now and point out the fact that while most naturally do fear prison, its effect as a deterrent is actually quite weak. Considering U.S. trends, we see a massive increase in incarceration over time, so with this basic observation, the punitive threat of prison clearly isn't working statistically. Likewise, prison is supposed to be some form of rehabilitation center, right? So does this system work to reform human behavior, taking in so-called criminals, and outputting mentally healthy, law-abiding citizens? Uh, no. In the United States, two-thirds of prisoners released reoffend within three years, often with a more serious and violent offense. Dr. James Gilligan, former director of the Center for the Study of Violence at Harvard Medical School, actually refers to prisons as graduate schools for crime and violence. So given all of this, perhaps we need to step back a bit, shake off the shackles of common perception, and ask ourselves what other roles the judicial and prison system really have. For if incarceration isn't statistically working as a deterrent, and those who get out of prison are more often worse than they were when they went in, something is clearly wrong. What else is going on here? You know, while the justification of incarceration is certainly viable with respect to true social threats, no different than the medical need to quarantine somebody who is a threat to society because of a contagious disease, the evolution of the prison tradition reveals some very dark truths. And the best way to think about it is from an historical perspective, considering race conflict, class conflict, in the context of economic and political expedience. The first thing to understand is that political power, like economic power, is sourced in social inefficiency. In other words, politicians need something to fight. And to a certain degree, the more problems a society has, the more the citizens tend to feel the need to give up their power to government control, with the most proven effective type of problem being fear. Usually fear of some perceived identifiable external group. Of course, this idea has been acknowledged for years, such as by political theorist Carl Schmitt in his The Concept of the Political, saying that political unity is achieved by defining a common enemy. Nothing new. The Nazis did this with the Jewish culture, the early U.S. did this with the Native American culture, and so on. 
in short, the trick is to push the idea that some subculture, usually in the minority, is the true source of all of society's woes, generating mass resentment and thereby ignoring more accurate, yet politically inconvenient realities. And while direct racism and discrimination is certainly alive and well in the world today, the more elusive yet relevant bias is actually economic. You see, the greatest threat to any political establishment is what do you mean? This? This is a platform. It's three dimensionals. There's the base. It's the... Yeah, I know it's not very good. Yeah, fuck off, Bob. Don't, don't make me shoot you again. You see, the greatest threat to any political establishment is any challenge to its underlying economic foundation, as all political platforms are rooted in an economic bias one way or another. And if you can brainwash the public into, say, viewing the failures of capitalism as instead rooted in the poor moral virtue of a trouble-causing subsection of the population, rather than a built-in consequence of perhaps capitalism's elitist psychology and scarcity-driven structure, you can maintain control. And this is where the common enemy scapegoat scam comes into play. It's not that bad. We simply demonize the victims of this system, shifting blame away from the more relevant, environmental, causal, social condition itself. And in the context of the justice system, the war on crime is a perfect tool. All the war on crime is, is a war on the poor and economically irrelevant. And if a society is conditioned to believe that a person breaking into their car to steal property is simply an amoral abomination with all the life choices in the world otherwise to make ends meet, then the causal shift is a success. The reality, however, is that most of those incarcerated today are there almost always due to crimes born from deprivation. Deprivation, which can be generalized in two forms, relative and absolute. Absolute deprivation is when a person's most basic needs are simply not met, and poverty is the lead source. The spectrum of disorder that arises from poverty is vast, from drug dealing, theft and prostitution in areas lacking employment opportunities, to emotional loss, self-worth neuroses, and illegal self-medication, leading to complex and elusive chain reactions which can result in destructive antisocial behavior. Today, one out of every 15 African-American kids in the United States have at least one parent in prison, usually the father. It's bad enough that the father figure is important to familial survival as the historical breadwinner, but the proven emotional toll on children who must go without such an influential parental figure also has dark results, as those children are also statistically more likely to be imprisoned as adults, in fact. And if you combine poverty with emotional deprivation, you have the perfect recipe for not only the manifestation of socially aberrant behavior, but the perpetuation of such distortions across generational time. Relative deprivation, on the other hand, is when our sense of worth and self-respect is associated to our cultural perception of success. While absolute deprivation is measured by basic health concerns, expressing the ever-important need for society to work to efficiently meet our immutable human needs for sanity and true security, relative deprivation exists in the realm of subjective comparison and resulting dehumanization. And likely the greatest example of this negative pressure is the state of class imbalance in the world. While it is true that the formerly classified poor of the West today actually live, in material terms, better than the upper class a thousand years ago, the dehumanizing wealth stratification occurring today continues to create complex, destabilizing psychosocial problems. Long considered an incentive for social progress, class difference and wealth imbalance has turned out to be a powerful public health issue generating massive psychological and sociological distortion. Want to be intellectually honest? The issues raised here have more to do with commerce than they do with a Second Amendment. A lot of people make a lot of money selling firearms and ammunition. The National Rifle Association has said the solution is to have armed security guards at every school. Certainly, you know, every piece of security we engage in can be helpful. But it's, you know, foolish to think that only security is what we need. You know, the great challenge is here, can we prevent these tragedies? 
Having I'm sorry to interrupt, Chief, but since you've just brought up this notion of prevention, which is, of course, the real issue here, right? I'm curious when this conversation is going to move to more relevant social science. You know, I, I see we have, for example, the NRA here. Hi. Uh, yet we don't have anyone from the pharmaceutical industry. Isn't it true that most of the mass shootings that have commenced have been done by people who are under the influence of psychologically mood-altering medications? Or better yet, Where's the drug czar of this country? Since the war on drugs has commenced, there has been a massive increase in gun-related drug violence. Are we just going to ignore this causality as well? Or better yet, I almost forgot, I have here about a hundred years of data on the relationship between economic imbalance, specifically wealth imbalance, and violence. You know, the stats have become very clear now that the gap between the rich and the poor creates more violence. The more gap, the more violence. And crime on the whole. Which might explain, by the way, why the United States, with the largest income gap in the world, also has the most violence and worst public health of any first world nation. Is this not worth a congressional discussion? I mean, with all due respect, you people can't possibly be naive enough to think that the reduction of certain guns, as the left suggests, or the increase in armed security in public places, as the right suggests, is really going to have a long-term effect on such deeply rooted sociological problems, right? A problem clearly rooted in structured dehumanization and economic deprivation. It's inherent to our social system. You know, is it not of some viable consideration to address this issue? No? Really? And then we have the so-called War on Drugs. When Richard Nixon declared the drug war in 1971, he asked for an initial $84 million. In 2013, the National Drug Control Budget requested $25.6 billion, with about a trillion dollars spent in total, and the result over time has been more drugs, easier access, increased potency, and more users. Today, almost half of the federal prison population are non-violent drug offenders, often mere users in fact, clearly a mental health issue rather than a punitive one. Draconian mandatory sentencing laws today can send kids to prison for decades for mere possession. And it is no secret that this criminalized subculture has been mostly born out of the prohibitive underground economies necessarily sprouted in poor areas of the country largely occupied by minorities. As an aside, we often forget how deeply racist the United States has been historically, assuming vast improvement. And yet today, there are more African Americans behind bars than were slaves before the American Civil War. After segregation, the black community was strategically isolated into low-income inner-city ghettos, which systematically robbed them of economic opportunity. And as the national culture matured, with racism slowly dissipating through the civil rights movement, the economic oppression set in motion at that time remained, creating a powerful cycle ever since. Today, one out of every three black men are expected to go to prison at some point in their lives. And in effect, the real oppressive mechanism in the world today is no longer race, but economic class. And the punchline is brutal. Not only are the poor and forgotten of our society conveniently turned into criminals, rather than clear examples of the failure of our social model, capitalist ingenuity prevails once again, transforming these people into pure, saleable commodities, creating a massive profit industry out of an otherwise economically useless social class. From thriving income generation via fines, tickets, bail posting, and lawyer fees, to the now massive network of servicing the millions of inmates via health care, food production, security hiring, parole officers, and the like, the prison and security industrial complex in the West is a thriving business enterprise and positive factor on economic growth. The cost to imprison one person for one year in the state of California is about $47,000. Extrapolating that to the total U.S. 2013 prison population of about 2.3 million, the incarceration service alone amounts to over $100 billion a year in income, and this isn't counting the other 5 million currently being serviced on parole. Today, the Corrections Corporation of America, G4S Wackenhut, and other private, for-profit security and prison firms benefit their investors and shareholders when incarceration rates increase. 
Not to mention the now extremely common labor use, or slave labor use I should say, of the prisoners themselves. And yes, we might feel some moral outrage when a Pennsylvanian judge gets caught sending kids to private detention centers for cash kickbacks. But then again, are we really surprised? There are even small towns in the Midwest where the majority are employed by the local prison. And if they don't have crime and prisoners, their town's economy is in the toilet. Not to mention that most police departments derive enormous funding from drug arrests and seizures. If the drug war stopped, the police department would lose billions in this country. And yes, the rabbit hole runs even deeper. If we step back even farther, we see a broader economic reinforcement here. You see, the drug trade is far from limited to your local street thugs. Today, US and European banks launder about $1 trillion in criminal, mostly drug money each year. Drug money has actually become a very relevant part of the Wall Street machine. Even just recently, HSBC Bank got caught moving about a billion dollars in drug money. Did the criminal executives get sent to jail? Of course not. Why? Because the legal system is mostly there to control the poor, not regulate the rich. HSBC paid a fine and moved on, likely working to reposition themselves again like the dozen or so other major banks that continue to launder drug money each year. Dick. Anyway, returning to our main point, this now highly capitalized blame game, common enemy approach, is not just there to dismiss the resulting poor, it is ubiquitous at every turn. Whether common crime, terrorism, mass murders, or anything destabilizing, we see the mainstream media, and even many in the so-called activist community, completely missing the point buried under the propaganda of in-the-box establishment self-preservation to one degree or another. And you know what Bill Moyer's solution to that is? Let nonviolent criminals out, like heroin dealers. Yeah, that's nonviolent. You're a genius, Bill. To have universal gun registration. What about... Wait, that's an important point. I am listening. For some reason, Wayne LaPierre is not making, so you're going to have to hear it from me. Universal background check means universal registration. Universal registration means universal confiscation, universal extermination. You know, it's like God is saying to us, look, you got to work with me on this. you got to work with me on this. I've given you a brain... I've given you the Second Amendment to your Constitution. I have given you weapons. Now, why don't you use them? The tyrants did it. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel okay. Castro took the guns. Many... Hugo Chavez took the guns. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. And the 21st century culture in decline, belligerent right-wing freak show award goes to... Alex Jones. <laughs> Whoa! Do that, you son of a bitch! Huh. It's about time I won an award. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alex Jones. And you know what? I'm here to rape your butt! You know why? Because it's gonna feel better if I do it before the New World Order does! That's right. The globalists are positioning themselves behind you right now. They're going to take your guns, put you in FEMA camps, and make you their slaves. They think I'm a slave? I'm not a slave. And then late one night when you're drinking their homosexually fortified juice boxes, bam, the butt rape begins. And you'll be happy that old Alex was there first to loosen you up real nice and good. Now, people, I'm not going to take too much time because huh, I'm a humble man. But I want everybody to go to my website right now and buy my newest DVD, The Conspiracy, Conspiracy, How the Global Elite Pays Me to Make the Liberty Movement Look Insane. That's right, people. I'm an astroturfer. I'm not here to help things. I'm here to make activists look like freaks. I take viable issues of real concern and make them sound as ridiculous as possible, just like all the other bobbleheads out there. I'm here to distract you, you morons and keep you fighting about nonsense. And I get paid to do it. <laughs> Woo! We interrupt this broadcast for an emergency announcement. It's an emergency because we say it is. This just in, U.S. airports remain on high alert at this time due to a pronounced terror threat. 
According to the FBI, a new sophisticated form of terrorist technology has surfaced, which is now forcing rapid new revisions of TSA airport security procedures. That's correct, Summer. On the heels of the 2006 liquid bomb threat and 2009 underwear bomber, this obscure new approach was revealed to authorities in a videotape allegedly found in an outhouse in Willy Wonkistan. While the date of the video is unknown, along with no clear understanding of who made it, the use of machetes, headdresses, and Arabic language was enough for federal authorities to declare it is indeed Al-Qaeda. The rather grainy video appears to show a medical procedure instructing how to implant explosives in the body cavities of babies, puppies, and kittens. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> <laughs> Baby go boom! In response to this development, the TSA, after an initial failed attempt to simply ban such creatures outright, has now instituted a new universal rule. All carry-on babies and small pets under 52 ounces must be sealed in a see-through plastic bag. Most people don't realize, but the Earth has been slowing for many years. And were it not for these huge and expensive fans behind me, we would have ground to a complete day and night halt. And every word out of my mouth is true. Do you know why? Because you heard it from some guy in a tie. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but Bob is officially dead. Final thoughts. We live in a social model based upon scarcity and inefficiency. This means that the more society solves problems, meets human needs, and stabilizes itself by recognizing the potentials and limits of natural law, the less economically viable it is in the monetary economy. There's a reason why Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final pursuit was a guaranteed income system in the United States. For he knew that racism was in many ways an extension of classism and the existence of poverty and deprivation in a world that can create an abundance to meet everyone's needs was nothing more than structural oppression coming from a failed and elitist social system. An impression that in fact generates crime and destabilization in a vicious cycle. You want to see a decline in prohibitive economies for drug sales, prostitution, and black market theft rings? You want to see society stop its enormous use of self-medicating drugs, both legal and illegal? You want to see an end of national war, an improvement of our social infrastructure so disease and accidents can be dropped to a relative fraction of what we have now? Or perhaps you want to see the end of school shootings gun violence and acts of terrorism, both in the context of state-funded black ops and real blowback, that it's time the human family recognize its global potential to achieve a post-scarcity reality, work to strategically share our resources, work to meet human needs directly, and focus collaborative energy on interests for true collective human betterment, hence removing the inherent warfare unnecessarily built into our archaic socioeconomic system along with all the resulting racism, hatred, dehumanization, oppression, and elitism it manifests. And no, I'm not telling you to go write your congressman. If the social system is the disease, then those who appoint themselves to assist its operation are the tumors and lesions. Voting with ballots or assuming what you choose to spend money on is going to change the way this world works is a delusion. It's going to take a new approach, a parallel uprising of power to shift the tide. And whether we're aware of it or not, this is happening slowly right now around us in the world. And the question is, where are you in this interest? And do you even care? If not, well, welcome to the culture in decline. And this show, as shitty as it is, is going to keep running. If so, then perhaps maybe this terrible reality show may come to an end faster than we think. But until that happens, rest assured I'll be here, arrogantly pointing out that most everything you believe and hold dear is wrong. So get back to your Bibles, video games, internet porn, and AK-47s, bitches, and have some fun out there in this dark circus we call normality. And until next time, I'm Peter Joseph, and whether you like me or not, I exist as an agent and victim of a culture in decline. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, don't let this fatly looking body fool you, okay? I work out four times a day, I run 19 miles a day, and I drink tangy tangerine like it's my job, all right? I'm only big like this because the new world order makes me... People, you know what keeps old Alex up at night? It's these daggum goblets. I'm sorry, I said goblets. <laughs> Listen up, people. These neocons are suckling the buzzard. That ain't your mama. It's these NWO scum. They're going around trying to butt rape everybody. They're just n nothing but a butt rape machine. <laughs> it's these NWO globalist communist scum that are going around like a butt rape machine. I'm a butt rape machine, butt rape machine. People, I am a butt rape machine. You know what? Instead of a bald eagle, the national symbol should be a man laying in submission in the fetal position, peeing on himself. That's what it should be. Peeing all over his damn self. If you can't tell, this is all an act. It's a shtick. That's why I act all crazy and shit. Flailing my arms and my neck like this. It's an act. It's a shtick. I need money. <laughs> Woo. Keep grunting. Yeah. How about that? You like some of that? You want some, Peter? <laughs> <laughs>